You know, obviously this is a broad topic that could be a day long session in and of itself. Uh, but we've already heard a lot of the important themes, right? Supportive care, the importance of cardiovascular health management, the importance of bone health management, toxicity management. Uh, we've had a session on the role of um, PSMA imaging, so I'm not really going to go into that very much. There goes the clock, all right. Um, my disclosures. So we'll talk about some of the current treatment options and the patterns of care because there's the practical conversations about what's really happening as opposed to just maybe the theoretical conversations about what, what we might like to see. Um, but the questions we often get are, how do you sequence all these drugs? How do you combine all these drugs? Should I do A or B or C? And I would say, you know, we can't answer every variation. Certainly we don't have level one evidence for most of those questions. But I'll offer a theoretical framework, right, in terms of how do we approach these treatment decisions? And you know, for those of you who've seen me speak here over the years, you'll see that this is the exact same framework we've been talking about the whole time, right? Um, and then we'll talk about how the increasingly divergent and diverse treatment options in MHSPC affect what we need to do in CRPC. And then we will touch on the, race, the recent phase three results within the last year. All right, so you know, here's what the treatment landscape looks like nowadays. Lots of different options. Radiation, of course, fits in here. Uh, you could talk about um, uh, lymph node dissection fitting in here or metastectomies fitting in here. And the various clinical considerations which were talked about in earlier sessions. So people you know, start to say, well, we've got a lot of treatment options. Now I don't know what to do anymore. But of course, I always say that's a great problem to have. That's exactly the position we want to be in is to have many different options that we can think through and offer to our patients. So I would say the framework for deciding how to treat patients for, for thinking about metastatic disease is always biology, right? The basic biology and the basic principles, there's nothing new here in cancer management. Nothing in biology makes sense. It's the quote of uh, Dabrowski, right? Of nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And of course, that's what we're managing in the patient with metastatic cancer is tumor evolution, right? I mean, it really is the pure Darwinian process of natural selection in which you have the species, the cancer, with all its diversity, with all its different, right, uh, variety and clones. And we come in with the natural selection of treatment which will lead to tumor evolution, which will select out you know, the resistant clones, which will get rid of the, uh, uh, the uh, vulnerable clones. It's, it's evolution in real time happening within our patients. And that's really how I approach the question of why would you sequence A or B or C or combine one or the other? It's all in light of evolution. Okay, so here's what the NCCN guidelines look like nowadays. It's, it's, it's difficult, it's a mess, right? They've got this two by two table for MCRPC where you have to consider what did the patient get in, in the HSPC setting? Thinking about yes, no of ARPIs, yes, no of docetaxel to get this two by two table, really saying that what was given previously should guide what's given next. And again, I mean, this is, just thinking about tumor evolution, of course this is the way we should approach it. And so one of the principles I'd, I'd ask you to think about in the management of advanced prostate patients, you know, we're not ever making decisions just about what to do at this step or how this step might make sense today. You know, the way I'm always thinking about it is I'm thinking about the patient's entire treatment course, thinking about that arc from beginning to end and how does the decision I make today affect every other decision I need to make tomorrow and the day after, right? How do we combine all of our options to get the best cumulative outcome for the patient at the end of that arc? So what about chemo, right? We're always stuck with this. We know the card data. People have seen this. The question is, do we just go ARPI after ARPI? And, you know, again, we, we had slide decks in 2014 saying, you know, these drugs are so close to each other, the cross resistance is gonna be high. And if you're gonna sequence, you should probably do Abby first and then start upstream and move downstream to the androgen receptor inhibitor. And of course, you know, Kim Chi's data has borne that out. But we didn't need to do a trial to really understand that, right? Basic evolutionary biology would have told you that was the right answer, and we know that. But now we have level one evidence to say, right, 
How much response do you get from a second ARPI late in the disease course? Well, here's your PFS, right? It's 2.7 months. It's basically the first follow-up. You don't get much response. You get about a 25% response rate, as we've seen from many data sets, you know, at most, maybe as low as 10%. Um, but without question, late disease, post dosi post one ARPI, going to a second taxane is better than going to a second ARPI, right? This isn't much debated anymore. But what about if we move forward? This is trickier, right? In the space of a patient who's had one ARPI, is a taxane better or is a second ARPI better? And the reason this is a difficult space is we don't have any trials like CARD designed to answer this question. The only data set we really have is this one, which was uh, from the Triton uh, 3 study, which, which I presented, in which this is the only study where the standard of care arm gave physicians choice and included a taxane, right? I mean, we got a lot, lot of complaints about this nowadays of doing randomized clinical trials where the control arm is a second ARPI, which is largely placebo, right? Low response rates. No one's doing it versus taxane. Well, we did. And what I would point out to you here, so this is, the, this is breaking down the PFS by the, uh, uh, the physician's choice of treatment. Over here, you see the docetaxel treated patients. Over here, the ARPI treated patients, right? And you see a big difference in the PFS. Eight and a half months for docetaxel, four and a half for the second ARPI. So I would have you think about these numbers as we move forward, you know, not just today, but, but you know, in, in coming meetings, looking at new studies saying what kind of outcomes would you expect from using a second ARPI? And what if this drug was randomized against docetaxel? What would you have seen then? Because of course, it's a legitimate argument that that should be the control arm on, on some of the studies we see. We, you know, we all live through all the uh, RCC trials randomized against serafinib, right? You know, why do we do that? Okay. All right. So here's real world data. Um, Dan George presented this a couple of years ago, talking about what are treatment patterns in the United States. You know, really over half of patients, over 60% are going to get an ARPI first line. That makes sense. But still, Right? Over half of patients are getting an ARPI in a second line. And now you say, all right, what's going on? Why is this happening? Um, we know why it's happening because it's, it's easier to do. And then you save chemo for the third line. Okay, we understand. That might make sense. You got first, second, third line, fourth line, and on. You've got a number of tools in the toolbox. But like I say, when I'm thinking about treating a patient, I'm thinking about the entire treatment arc from beginning to end. I'm not just thinking about what to do today. So you could say, well, I want to save my chemo. I want to save these harder drugs for later in the disease course, which, which I understand. But then we get this problem. So this is the reality of treatment in the United States. That, now, in my clinic, you know, the median number of lines that a prostate pan, of therapy that a prostate cancer patient gets is about five. In the United States, it's one, right, for CRPC. Only 49% of patients are getting second-line treatment, right? And by the time you get to third-line treatment, now you're talking about, you know, a quarter of patients, less than 30%. So the idea that, look, we're going to save drugs and we're going we're to save them for third, fourth, fifth-line treatment, I would tell you, you should probably assume you're not going to get third, fourth, fifth-line treatment in most of your patients, right? The thought process for the newly diagnosed patient or the patient at first-line MCRPC is the reality is most men are only going to get two shots on goal in the CRPC setting. So when you're thinking about how to give drugs and how to combine and how to sequence, I would say think about tumor evolution, but also think about the fact that you got to use your best drugs first. Don't, don't, don't you know, save a good drug, leave it in the cabinet so that the patient never gets the benefit of it, right? Take the most powerful effective drugs you have and bring them forward as far as you can. And this is why I think combination therapy is so important. You know, and there's a lot of semantics we get into, intensification, uh, doublet, triplet, whatever, the, the labels don't matter. The principle of combination therapy in cancer is not new. It's new to prostate cancer, because you know how it is in this field. We're always 30 years behind everyone else, right? But, you know, 
combination therapy in, in cancer goes back to DeVita. It goes back to the 1960s and 70s, right? ABVD, et cetera. It's only in prostate cancer where this is a new development and we're talking about it like it's, a, like it's novel. It's not novel, we're just late to the game. And that the reason I would encourage you to think about combination therapy is again, bring the drugs up front, give them early, because the reality is for most patients, you're not gonna get a chance to give it later, okay? All right, so I'm gonna pivot here and talk about, uh, you know, I always like to do this. What's the new data in the last year since we last gathered? So PSMA4, this is an important study, right? Right now we give lutetium only post docetaxel per label, but we wanna move it up. It's a great drug, it's an effective drug. So PSMA4 is trying lutetium in the pre docetaxel setting Patients who already received an one ARPI, um, obviously they had to be uh, positive by PET scan. And so they'll be randomized either to lutetium or to the ARPI. And importantly, and this is a, a trial design question we have to have for regulators, right? Importantly, crossover was allowed. It was built into the study. I think this is the way most studies should be designed. This is what patients want. It is patient friendly. It also avoids the problem of patients shopping around until they find an alternative path to get their, uh, to get their lutetium, because that's the motivation, right? All right, so this study was uh, designed for PFS as a primary endpoint, and it's positive, right? Unequivocally positive study, hazard ratio 0.43, uh, median PFS for lutetium 12 months versus just under six for the ARPI change. You would say this is, this is good. I mean, there's no question. Not a surprise, though. This is what we expect from, from a good drug. Down here, you see the PSA changes from baseline. Up here, you see the objective responses. Everything points to lutetium being better than, uh, than, than the ARPI. But the problem was this. Unfortunately, you know, the interim overall survival shows no benefit to lutetium. In fact, it slightly favors uh, the, the control arm. And I would say that the problem here with interpreting this is right here, right? It's the fact that 84% of patients who went on the control arm crossed over to lutetium. So in essence, this is a study of is it better to get lutetium right away or is it better to get it eight months later, right? And at the end of the day, the hazard ratio here of, well, you see the medians, you know, overall cycle 19.2 months versus 19.5, it's the same. So what I would interpret this to mean is that giving lutetium now versus eight months later is equivalent. It doesn't really mean that the control arm is equivalent, right? It just says this is a timing question because 85% of patients, 84.2% crossed over. So this is not FDA approved. You can't do this today. How regulators are gonna treat this is an open question and I don't know the answer. We also saw data, the press release from Splash, we haven't seen the data yet. This is another uh, PS, uh, PSMA targeted lutetium radioligand therapy and very similar, again, positive for PFS, but the OS signal is not there. And again, the hazard ratio slightly, slightly favors the, uh, the control arm. So almost the same results as we saw in PSMA4. All right, and very quickly, I'm just gonna talk about contact two. So this was just at GU ASCO. This was a study looking at uh, atezolizumab CABO versus a second NHT in high-risk patients. Every patient had to have soft tissue disease. The primary endpoint or the dual endpoints were PFS and OS. I'd point out here 23% of patients with liver metastases, 52% with de novo metastatic disease, a very high-risk population, not the same as some of our other studies. Progression-free survival. Now, this was a problem, right? So when you see this stair step in a PFS curve, what that means is patients are not progressing symptomatically. The progression is being detected at the pre-specified time points for imaging, right? And that instead of a smooth line, you get this stair step. The difference between the PFS of the, the two arms is, is one follow-up period. And you know, you could you could actually go into this statistical design, you can get vastly different results. Look at that, five minutes, that's awesome. Um, you can get vastly different results just by changing when you assess. If you scan at three months versus two versus, you know, two and a half, you can get a two-month difference in survival, or you can get 
three weeks just by study design. It's not a reflection of the actual drugs. So, so there's artifactual data here and it's, it's a real problem. The standout finding for this study is definitely that there's a benefit in liver metastases. I think that's notable, but the rest of it, you know, is, is uh, not too encouraging in overall survival. You know, there's not a signal here, right? I mean, you know, it, it's a weak signal. It's, it's 0.79, um, but you know, 16.7 months versus 14.6. So, so this, is a, this was a, a disappointing um, data set, unfortunately. And uh, again, I'm not sure how regulators will treat this. All right, so in summary, CRPC has become increasingly complex as new paradigms have developed, new drugs have been approved, which is exactly the position we want to be in. But with this many drugs in the toolbox, what I would encourage you to do is think not only about what decision, how your decision makes sense for this step, but how all the steps across the patient's journey need to be combined to give the best cumulative outcome. Remember a key operational principle, use your best drugs early. Use combinations early because you're only gonna get a few shots on goal. And it's unlikely, frankly, with this many drugs that you're gonna use all of them over a patient's treatment course. And I recommend thinking about classes of drugs and considering how switching or combining classes, classes have advantages from the perspective of disease evolution. Um, and you know, the, the, the most important thing is please continue enrolling to clinical trials. There's a ton of drugs in the pipeline. The job's not done until we've cured the last patient. Thank you.